Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased and honoured to be uh, in Bucharest in this great city as part of a three-man team dealing with, as uh, Adam has said in his opening remarks, um, a contribution to uh, knowledge with regards to this damages directive right throughout Europe. Um, in those opening remarks, um, Adam set out what the aim and ambition should be and is with regards to all European law, not simply the European Law and Damages Directive. It is, in fact, that each member state would, at the same level, apply the same consistency and apply the same uniformity with regard to all principles. Principles whether they arrive from the TEU or the Treaty of the Function of the European Union, and now the Charter of Fundamental Rights or the Damages Directive. That's the ultimate ambition, in fact, if it could ever be achieved. But it can only be uh, commenced, I think, on a step-by-step -step basis. And if at the end of this process we can get something collectively from the Damages Directive, it will be in fact, a step in that direction. Um, this is not really a conference in the normal sense or a seminar in the normal sense where people uh, who are nominated to deliver papers do so, either by way of reference to the papers or speaking to it. It is a little less formal than that. It is more of an educational process um, that we can all engage with and my contribution is simply to outline what the general principles of the directive are. And it is not intended that you necessarily will leave this seminar with full knowledge of the damages directive. I will be referring to a number of slides where I have set out in considerable detail um, what I propose to say. From time to time, I will skip those. They're there in the background. My ambition is to, so to speak, whet your appetite. If I can encourage you uh, to have an interest in the damages directive, if I can point out the, the highlight problems that we have already encountered and are likely to encounter for several years to come, then that will be a good thing. Do not for a moment be concerned about understanding all of this or following all of this. If you, in fact, um, obtain an interest in it, then you will from time to time refer to it and you will from time to time pick up incrementally more knowledge in relation to it. We know it was uh, brought into force in 2014, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But can I say just a little bit about um, the state of play throughout Europe um, with regards to competition law in general? As you know, there is considerable diversity between member states as to what type of entity uh, deals with competition law. Some, in some states, they are designated courts. In other states, they are tribunals, both at first instance and at appellate level. But there is a vast difference to be found right across Europe with regard to those entities, with regard to their staffing levels and the expertise that you can find uh, within them. Some are full-time. Some um, are staffed by qualified lawyers, economists, forensic accountants, for example, Adams Tribunal in London is probably one of those. And the throughput of cases corresponds largely to, to the, the, the big member states and also um, reflects the, the degree of expertise that these bodies have at first instance and at appellate level. So it's not surprising that countries like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Netherlands, and, and I'm sure several others um, have quite a throughput of cases. They have developed at a pace perhaps uh, greater than others, um, all because of this expertise, all because the expertise is being fed by this uh, uh, experience of a variety of cases going through them. We have a kind of a second tier uh, in some member countries where you have a respectable number of cases and you have a respectable variable and diversity of views. And then we have uh, smaller nations, and I'm including Ireland in relation to that, where Articles 101 and 102 largely can be incidental to one's working life. Um, we judges um, combine the application of competition law with many other and different functions. They are 
cases from time to time, but they can be quite infrequent. Um, and thus, one may not be able to get the same experience as can be obtained in, in, in bigger uh, and more experienced tribunals. Um, with regards to Ireland, for example, uh, all competition cases on the civil side start at the High Court level, which is a constitutional court and our major trial court. There is no dedicated um, section of the High Court dealing with competition law. There are no dedicated judges in the High Court dealing with competition law. But generally, there are one or two who have an interest in competition law, and thus the throughput of cases go before them. Um, for the rest of the time, they do commercial, they do IP law, they can vary into different branches. And yet, from time to time, we are called upon to deal with competition law. And when that occurs, as Adam has said, we are obliged by European law to apply uniformity and consistency as much as we can, compatible with the French, the English, and the other bigger countries where uh, they have really these expert tribunals um, and throughput of cases, giving them um, quite a degree of competence in relation to this matter. So our challenge really is to try not in any way uh, to neutralise those countries, but in fact to uplift the second and third tier countries to, to bridge the gap of experience, to bridge the gap of knowledge uh, that, that some of you might think exists um, with regard to this matter. I always find that if you're going to talk about a subject, you should say something about the background. You should say something about its history, because it's so much easier to understand the key concepts if, in fact, you understand why it was necessary in the first instance for the measure in question to be enacted. I've always thought, from a lawyer's point of view, that if you can get your head around what the concepts are, filling in is purely a matter of detail. It's purely a matter of reading, it's purely a matter of time, it's purely a matter of acquiring knowledge. But if you cannot interrelate the big concepts, if you don't know where they fit, if you don't know how to apply them, then all the reading in the world, all the knowledge in the world is capable of going off in cul-de-sacs without any fruitful end. So it's quite important to understand, I feel, um, why it was necessary, why it was taught necessary, in the first instance, to bring the directive in, to try and understand the major concepts, and you will do so by having a knowledge of the difficulties um, that preceded the, uh, the enactment of the directive. And then, as we go through the directive, you will see the key areas. Um, this first slide is, is simply an introduction. It's telling, it's in part one of the presentation you will see I've referred to what's behind it, part two, the essential provisions, and then there is a recommendation for collective redress. Everything, of course, pinges on Articles 101 and 102. Look at the general application. They have direct effect. In other words, they, in, they, they have um, an application between um, private individuals in private litigation um, outside entirely the relationship between the state or any such body and individuals. They create rights and obligations. Once rights and obligations are created under EU law, there is an obligation on every national court to implement it. And there is such an obligation um, to make sure that individuals who suffer any loss or damage can have access to it. Um, this is The next slide talks in a little bit more detail about what Article 101 is. Everybody knows we're talking about agreements between undertakings, decisions by associations, concerted practices, affecting or capable of affecting interstate trade with the object or effect. This is all very standard stuff. And then we know within the provisions of the article itself, we set out what is sometimes referred to as the hardcore provisions, which you will uh, see them listed there. Price fixing uh, limit or, or controlling production markets and market sharing with suppliers and others. Of course, it's always possible uh, to get reprieve from any of those prohibited infringements if you comply with Article 101.3 of the treaty. Equally so, when we discuss 101, we immediately link it correctly with 102 because both are the essential provisions uh, dealing with competition law. This deals with an entirely different concept, but equally as damaging when it's in place 
as the Cartelias are under 101. Uh, this refers to uh, an entity, an undertaking in a dominant position, and that undertaking is abusing its dominant position, which, of course, is affecting interstate trade in the internal market or in any substantial part of it, and that likewise is prohibited as being incompatible with competition law. Uh, once more, the conditions are specified in there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this next bit um, that I propose to deal with is uh, a, a little background um, leading up to the directive itself. You will all be familiar with um, Regulation 01-2003. That really created a seismic reform of antitrust procedures right throughout Europe. For the first time ever, the direct enforcement of 101, including 1013 and 102, was given to national courts. The ECN, a network of national competition authorities and the Commission was established, and they work in close harmony so as to apply the provisions in this uniform way of both 101 and 102. Uh, Regulation 1, 2003 also made provision for uh, an exchange of information, opinion and advices between the NCAs and the Commission, with indeed also uh, making provision whereby judges of member states can obtain the uh, opinion of the Commission on any matters um, that might fall within their ambit. So it created this structure um, which heretofore was vested entirely in the Commission at local level now. Um, prior to that, as you know, um, all uh, 1013 applications were dealt with by the Commission only. That resulted in the Commission really being engulfed in such applications with the result that they were overwhelmed. As part of the principle of subsidiarity, Regulation 101, <coughs> or Regulation 1, 2003, was um, invoked. And that freed up the Commission uh, to concentrate um, their resources, limited as they are, um, in, in chasing serious infringements of 101 and 102, essentially under 101, the cartelier activities. So what was the necessity to concentrate? On what? Private enforcement. Why was it necessary to concentrate on private enforcement? Because after several years of assessing what the situation was, most people involved realised that public enforcement on its own was not sufficient. For the full effectiveness of competition law, it was necessary to combine in a proactive way private enforcement with the already existing public enforcement. Because if you can have two that meet at a crossroad and travel together, it is very much likely that the full effectiveness, which is a principle of European law, the full effectiveness will be achieved to a far greater extent than otherwise. Um, <clears throat> this principle of effectiveness runs right throughout European law. This principle of giving an effective remedy of member states being obliged to have in place rules whereby any rights created by European law can be enforced at domestic level runs right, right throughout the treaty provisions, secondary legislation, it runs right throughout the Charter now, and it runs right throughout what are called general principles of European law. I will come back to those in just a little while. And this full effectiveness bit, as you will see from the slide, um, was required in order to enhance the efficient functioning of the internal market, to facilitate at a local and domestic level those who might have suffered harm from infringements of 101 and 102, and it also was necessary so as to provide some deterrent message for those who might be involved in such activity, or in fact those who were. Um, the necessity to concentrate <coughs> arose because of the difficulties which existed at national level um, for individuals who might in fact be thinking of taking private action. Uh, this stemmed in the first instance from the nature um, of competition infringements. Generally speaking, um, there is a deliberate concealment involved. Generally speaking, even if experts can be retained on behalf of uh, an intended plaintiff, 
it will be extremely difficult, and even to a sophisticated and technical eye, as I've said, to understand um, what the um, infringement is, to be able to obtain sufficient information that might allow you assess whether or not you have um, a credible case. And all of this is deliberately carried out. Activities by carteliers are not accidentally bumped into. It's not like somebody you might meet on a shopping street. Um, they are, generally speaking, well thought out. They go from being a concept to a plan to an implementation of the plan. This involves a lot of people, it involves a structure, and it involves a deliberation at every turn by those involved. Um, in fact, I'm convinced that many people who deliberately engage in this type of activity do what we would be familiar uh, with uh, a cost-benefit. I have in the slide here um, a cost-cost analysis. So they try and work out what benefit, what financial benefit they will gain by entering into this activity, by pursuing this activity as long as they possibly can. They will, of course, also assess the risk of being caught, the risk of their activity coming to the um, attention of the NCAs or the Commission, and the risk of action being pursued. And they will then make a judgment call. Is it worth it or is it not? And that's the level of sophistication that many of these major enterprises undertake ever before they start this. So it's extremely difficult for a private individual, even if the individual in question is an SME or even a big company in a member state, it's extremely difficult to um, go after and pursue um, harm which you've obviously suffered on account of this. Then what happens even if you get this uh, information together? Apart from engaging experts, whether they're accountants, whether they're economists, whether they're lawyers or otherwise, you must engage with us judges. So you must engage with a national um, legal process. <coughs> Um, and that brings into play um, our familiarity um, with the subject matter and also, of course, brings into play uh, very significantly what our rules are at a local level. Um, us judges uh, like things, largely speaking, to be fairly compact, to be fairly net, to be fairly well-defined. If we can come up with a fairly simple answer to adjudicate in any particular case, why not take it? Why would you look for a more complicated process? Why would you want to engage in, in some in-depth analysis if, in fact, a solution is more ready-made for you? So we, we tend to look at um, the problem we have on the first page basis. Now, that's slightly unfair to some of us because we sometimes want to look behind that. We are not all, always able to do it because of local rules. We are not always able to do it because we may not have the experience gathered from the throughput of cases that I mentioned earlier. But we've still got to do it. So judges are faced with lots of difficulty. They're faced with this interaction between public and private enforcement. They're faced with this problem about limitation periods which frequently arise. They want to know what is the scope of any decision from the NCA and the reason why that is necessary because on some occasions the intended plaintiff, the intended mover can rely upon that decision. They will want to know what kind of decisions have been made and addressed to whom. They will encounter jurisdictional issues because inevitably before Articles 101 and 102 can apply there will be a cross-border element. And then if they get through all of that, the judges, um, that's only the halfway stage. The whole purpose of mounting in action is, of course, to get to the bottom line, i.e. to obtain compensation for the harm suffered. So we then get into this question of compensation. It's absolutely simple at a theoretical level. It's absolutely easy at, um, uh, at an abstract level. But once you start working your way through various issues with regard uh, to the claim mounted, um, whether the facts are sufficient, what are the theories behind it? What are the suppositions there? You have economists. I remember doing a case <clears throat> maybe five or six years ago when I was in the High Court in Dublin. We had a stream of economists on both sides, all highly qualified individuals. 
many of them PhDs, and the, the issue was net enough, and they gave diametrically opposed evidence on the same point. And um, I, I rant a little with regard to that, because if you recall what, what duty an expert is supposed to have in the first instance, his duties to the court, um, and if in fact we judges can insist upon such experts honouring that duty, it makes our life much easier. In essence, in fact, of course, they entirely reverse it. They play piper to the person who pays the tune, and that's their client. And here we had, literally across the table here, PhDs, professors, on the same narrow point giving diametrically opposed evidence. It, it really makes our job extremely difficult. So once we get into this compensation, it was, in truth, a bit of a nightmare for many of us that had to do it. Um, then there was a, a move, um, there was a recognition of the urgency that member states would not be able to achieve any level of uniformity themselves. National rules um, differed from place to place. We had our common law system in England and in Ireland. We have a civil law system with, very, with considerable variations uh, amongst um, European states. If you look at the third indent there, it covers um, matters like what court uh, does one uh, access, what are the rules, how do you start the action, are there any evidential presumptions, what about disclosure, the uh, investigation file of the NCA, and you have various, various problems um, that all of us encounter. Look at the third indent from the bottom, the forum shopping. Um, of necessity, there is this cross-border element um, when 101, 102 comes into place. Um, why would not large undertakings who have set out deliberately to embark upon cartelier activity, why would they not have lawyers to advise them, if you sue in Germany, you have a better chance of winning than in France or than in um, Bucharest or than in Dublin? Of course they do. They have a network um, of experts at all disciplines available to them and they tap into them because this is a business in itself, actually. So forum shopping was quite a significant thing. Um, and uh, it was, that brought uncertainty. Um, that gave them a great advantage. In fact, it gave them a competitive advantage on the marketplace as well. So over a period of time, um, various um, entities um, energized the drive that led to uh, this directive. You will see there, I've mentioned the Court of Justice. These are several cases. Please note the time gap between Savannah in 1974 and really the critical driver with regard to all of this in 2001. And then we had a series of cases which I'll touch on in just a moment. Manfrede, Federer, Otis, and the rest of them. So the Court of Justice really um, put its shoulder to the wheel of the drive towards 2014 when the directive came into place. The Commission was also terribly conscious of this for several years. The Commission, uh, uh, invest the commission commissioned uh, the Ashurst Report in 2004 that led to the Green Paper, etc. Proposed for the proposal for the directive in 2013 and then we led to it. Side by side, some member states um, at a pace and to a degree perhaps more than others brought in reforms at national level. That really is a snapshot of the history. From 1974, a gap of 27 years or more, courage, and then we have the directive. There were a number of milestone judgments and there can be no doubt whatsoever but that courage and Crehan in 2001 was probably the start point um, that energised um, both member states and the Commission to do something collectively about the private enforcement. Courage and Crane laid down very simple rules. If the EU confers rights on a private citizen, there is an absolute obligation on member states to have in place a structure by which those rights can be enforced. They are directly applicable at a horizontal level. Of course, they are at a vertical level. They are directly applicable at a horizontal level. And once that became established, it meant that two private individuals could go to a local court 
and could sue under the domestic equivalent of 101 and 102 if, in fact, it could establish an infringement and it had suffered harm. That really was a cataclysmic moment in the enforcement of, of competition law. Um, we have other cases then that immediately followed, which supplemented these quite, quite significantly as well. Um, we had um, Manfrede, um, and we had Federer, as we know, um, and then we had Otis. Um, Manfrede created this situation whereby the, the principle of the domestic court being in charge of procedure was upheld. It was subject only to the principle of equivalence and the principle of effectiveness. Federer, I, I recall well, when the decision was given, created consternation among certain states. It said no longer was there an absolute prohibition on a private individual having access to a file of a national competition authority. It said that in principle there was no reason why access could not be gained to such documents. Any law from a member state which created an absolute ban was incompatible with the full effectiveness of competition law. It said, however, and this was one of the difficulties, that it was for the national court to assess on a case-by-case -case basis as to what uh, documents one might have access to. And um, then we look at Donny Shimu, um, which again spoke about access to the file of the NCA, um, and then we had Cohn's decision, which was quite a significant decision in its own way. It permitted an individual who came within the umbrella principle um, to sue uh, for any harm that that might have suffered. So we had a series of cases which really um, underpinned the drive for, uh, if it's not harmonization, definitely to drive for more coherency across the EU. That is a very brief background. There is more detail on part one of this presentation about what led up to the direct. As you can see, that's the broad outline of it, uh, which speaks for itself. This summary of the main changes is a slide really worth looking at. Um, in the first instance, it makes provision for easier access to the evidence. Diane is going to deal with that uh, subject a little later in the presentation, and I won't dwell on it, but that was absolutely a critical feature um, with regard um, to uh, making it possible to bring a private action. Um, the, the rules with regard to discovery, disclosure, access to documents, are within the province of each member state. The rules differ. Um, some have blanket immunity um, on a certification by a minister that this is in the public interest. Others, not so. Um, some are less inclined, uh, some judges, some courts are less inclined to permit access than others. Some member states feel that an NCA's file is sacrosanct and cannot be looked at whatsoever. But the, the, the changes brought about to the evidential material um, within the uh, directive is well worth a serious consideration. The second bullet point is that in future, a, a private individual can in fact take the benefit of a decision by the NCA or the commission which has established um, the liability aspect of the um, infringement in question. I will come back to the limitation periods in a moment because uh, uh, they are indeed quite generous and, and can potentially raise difficulties under the Convention of Human Rights. The passing on defence we will deal with in more detail later this afternoon. The directive makes provision for full compensation. In other words, it implements the principle of restitutio in integrum. Whatever you have lost on account of the infringement, in theory, you, you should be able to, uh, to recover it. Uh, it excludes punitive or exemplary damages. I'm not sure how many member states have that. Um, in principle, I, I know England um, has had it, I think, since a famous case in 1964, and it's also available um, in, in Irish law. Um, it deals specifically with certain presumptions, certain evidential matters, when 
The infringement is sought under 101 and it deals with um, joint and several liability. The, the next um, slide is really a, li a little more um, of what the overall purpose of the directive is. And it largely fleshes out um, what I have previously uh, just stated. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this question of direct effect of directives um, is a very important issue, and I'm not sure how often we all come across it. As you know, there is a major distinction between regulations and directives. Directives uh, are binding us to the result of member states, but they leave to member states a certain amount of discretion as to how they transpose that directive into national law. Whereas regulations, of course, are directly applicable, and not only are they directly applicable, they're also, they also have direct effect. When can a directive, if at all, have direct effect? And of course, you, won't, you must immediately make the distinction between a vertical direct effect, that is, an inaction involving the state or any emanation of the state, and a direct effect at a horizontal level, that is between private individuals in an action where no emanation of the state is involved. This topic has become very um, uh, evident um, with the uh, enactment of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. As you know, under Article 6 of the TEU, the Charter of Fundamental Rights now has the same legal value as treaties. Questions have immediately arisen as to whether or not the provisions of the Charter can have direct effect. The principle of direct effect equally applies uh, with regard to all directives, including this direct. So you will see there from that slide that VD is vertical direct effect, that I'm suggesting that a, a directive never has any direct effect at all, either horizontally or vertically, until the expiry date for its transposition into domestic law has passed. If that date is gone, and if it hasn't been transposed into domestic law, or if inadequately transposed into domestic law, it can in fact be invoked vertically, that is, when the state is involved. And there are certain conditions that must exist before that takes place. The directive has to be clear, unconditional, and in fact, it, and, and there is no further requirement to give it expression in domestic or European law. In other words, within itself, you can see what the rights are and you can see what the obligations are. That's vertical direct effect and we're probably generally familiar with all of that. It's the next bit I think that's really controversial and that's really interesting, the horizontal effect. And when we talk about competition law, when we talk about making private enforcement more accessible to the individual at domestic level, that is the critical line um, that we are referring to. Not so much that we sue the state, but in fact when you want to sue a cartelier, when you want to sue a dominant player uh, in the market yourself, for whatever reason the NCA may not have got involved, may not do so, but you want to do it. So, the first point is that at a horizontal level, a directive can never uh, take effect. Um, that is, whether the limitation date is passed or not. That is, even if the directive is clear, um, if it's unambiguous, and if, it, if it, it is a full expression of the intent of the European element. It just doesn't apply. Um, there are certain compensations for that. They have been referred to by Advocate General in a case called AMS as palliative measures. The first is, of course, when we are looking at a directive, uh, we must adopt an interpretive technique which has regard to the wordy directive, has regard to the purpose of the directive, and that interpretive technique must try and achieve the result uh, specified in the directive if that's possible. So when you're interpreting a piece of domestic law uh, in the context of a directive, you must keep those in mind. Of course, there are limitations. Um, you must adhere to the principle of legal certainty. You cannot retrospectively apply to it. And you cannot strain the interpretation to such a level that it becomes what is known 
as contra-legion. Um, when looking at domestic law for this, it's quite important, bear in mind that you can look outside the immediate provision in question. For example, if the directive um, is intended, or if the national measure is intended to reflect the particular provision of a directive, and if you're not able, by this interpretive tool, to read the national measure in conformity with the directive, you might be able to read a different national measure in conformity with it, which will have this knock-on effect on the provision in question. So just bear in mind that last indent that you must look at the whole body of, um, of domestic law when you're interpreting that. The, the second one is the broad conception of the state. That speaks for itself. Um, state liability for a directive. If the state has failed to transpose a directive or transpose it directly, then in certain circumstances a private individual can sue the state. Three conditions must be satisfied. The purpose of the directive must be clear and must relate to the conferral of right on individuals. Secondly, those rights and the corresponding obligations must be evident from the wording of the directive itself. You cannot look outside the directive to see if that's the case. And of course, there must be a, a causal link between the member state's failure to bring the directive into play and the damage that you have suffered. General principles of EU law. And if you start researching what they are, if you start trying to identify a particular source, you will have difficulty, and indeed you will spend some time doing so. But they're there, and they're recognised in treaty provisions. Again, if you look at Article 13, I think, of the EEC, which is now, um, which is now Article 19, if you look at Article 6 of the TEU, um, it talks about the Charter of Human Rights, it talks about the Convention of Human Rights, and it talks about general principles of EU law um, ha having a treaty status or their equivalent. In those cases, Mangold and Cusa de Becchi, the court for the first time invoked this general principle of EU law in the context of a directive. And um, Cusa de Becchi um, was an employment contract, an, an employment contract case. Um, it involved a, a German lady working for a German company um, and the length of notice which her employer was obliged to give her in order to terminate her contract. Under German law, that length of notice incrementally increased with the amount of service uh, that you had with a particular employer. However, any service up to the age 25 was disregarded. This lady um, was employed by the firm Swedex from age 18 to about 30. But in fact, they only gave her two months' notice, three months' notice, um, because they were obliged by domestic law only to have regard to the period of time after age 25 to the time to the age when they proposed to fire her. She said, that's discrimination on age grounds. She said, absolutely, it has nothing to do with anything else. She goes before the Labour Court in Cologne. Uh, they say, we're bound by domestic law. The domestic law is quite clear, and uh, we agree that there's a difficulty here about its compatibility with European law. We can't do anything about that. Under the German constitution, or under general principles of EU law, as you know, if a national measure is incompatible with an EU measure, then we are obliged as judges to step aside the national measure. Under the German constitution, a serious question mark arose about that process because the German constitution obliged and obliges courts to enforce the law on the statute book until the federal constitutional court has said it's unconstitutional. And it gives a reference to all of this. Um, the directive in question could not be relied upon because it didn't have horizontal effect. It didn't have horizontal application. So what did the court do? They said, look, there's a general principle of EU law dealing with non-discrimination on age grounds. It is to be found in Article 19 of the Treaty of the European Union, and it's to be found in Article 21 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's a general principle. OK, we have the um, non-discrimination directive, I think it's in, in 2000. But that 
only creates a general framework giving further expression to this principle of non-discrimination in age grounds. We couldn't apply the directive for the reason I've mentioned. So the court ignored the directive and said, we have a general principle. And if there is a general principle, it must be that it can be applied horizontally. So arising from Mangold, followed by Cusa de Vecchi, and followed by AMS, and followed by Domines, the three or four other cases, um, the court has carved out what might be a very interesting development in the future with regard to matters covered by a directive. It said that if those matters can be traced back to and can rest upon a general principle, then even though the directive doesn't have horizontal effect, the general principle will have horizontal effect. And that's quite an important point that might come into play with regard to the damages directive. It applies generally, but it can indeed um, applied to the uh, damages directive. Um, the next series of slides um, are, are, are almost practical matters. Um, who can, for example, sue? Um, you might think that's a very obvious question. Indeed, it's a very obvious question, but is there a very obvious answer? And um, there are some obvious answers, but also some answers that are not entirely obvious. You will see from the second indent that if your claim is for damages, you must have suffered harm. That's a quid pro quo to the institution of any proceedings where that is your remedy. On the other hand, if you're looking for an injunction or if you're seeking a declaration, it is sufficient if you're threatened with harm. You do not, as such, have to uh, have suffered harm. Harm in this sense I use for the purposes of establishing standing to bring the action, locus standi. Harm has another aspect to it, which is, of course, the quantification of the damage that you saw. Um, factors such as causation, remoteness, all of these points are governed procedurally um, by domestic law, subject, and always remember this, please, to the principle of equivalence and to the principle of effectiveness. But they are used in a different context than harm in this slide, which is all related uh, to whether or not you can mount an action um, in a domestic court um, for a breach of the domestic equivalent of 101, 102. Incidentally, under Regulation 1, 2003, uh, a domestic court is obliged, when hearing this action, to apply 101, 102 if there's any element of cross-border activity involved. Now, who may sue you? Uh, uh, again, uh, that's just an add-on to the second one. It is any person who has suffered directly or indirectly um, any harm. Um, and uh, the second indent, Articles 12 and 13, is something I'll come back to in a moment. Now, who can be sued? Uh, it, it is a, an obvious question. It can pose difficulties for lawyers. Um, it's critically important, obviously, to get the correct defendant. Otherwise, you can be non-suited at a very early stage and at a very, uh, uh, at great cost addressees in public law decisions in a follow-on action, non-addressees in a standalone action. And as you will see, um, I've pointed out in, in subparagraph D, it's very important that when there are groups involved, when there's a complex structure involved, um, that you consider whether or not it's the parent or any sibling or offshoot of the parent. Um, liability in principle, don't forget, is joint and several, a point I will come back to when briefly looking at Article 11. This is another quite important practical matter um, uh, that we would consider if any case can be for us. Us judges, when we're looking at cases, you know, might have a, a, a short, quick list of points we would want to take off. Um, has the plaintiff established standing? Is the correct defendant identified? Are there any other defendants that should be in place? Um, is this the right court? Uh, is this the right jurisdiction rather than court? Is this the right jurisdiction in which this type of action um, is to be brought? What about if, in fact, um, the named defendant has carried on uh, activities through a variety of subsidiaries in different jurisdictions? Who is the dominant uh, jurisdiction or which is the dominant jurisdiction in which the action should be brought? 
how are you going to interplay with the other jurisdictions if proceedings are already in being, either by the same plaintiff or by other plaintiffs? It, it can become quite a complex, quite a difficult issue, but it's one we just, from time to time, may have to grapple with. Um, look at paragraph D there, I speak about parallel actions, and this really can be quite difficult. Um, when can you sue? It's a fairly obvious question. I'm not talking about limitation periods now as such. I'm talking about are they in existence uh, sufficient ingredients for an action in which um, can be mounted before your court? I'll come back to Article 9 and I'll come back to Article 10 in just a little while. Another um, matter on your quick list might be whether or not the directive applies at all. In other words, what is within the scope, what is within the scope of the directive? And there are a number of matters that are very simple, and I'm quite certain all of you are very conscious of it, that you should um, immediately have to the fore. Evidently, if the cause of action occurs before the directive uh, was brought into force, it's out. Um, evidently, if the court was seized of it before December 2014, the directive doesn't apply. Watch your limitation periods. Um, because uh, uh, they are uh, set out in the directive and are fairly critical. Some serious complications can arise. Um, as I say, what happens if the plaintiff's only cause of action is really dependent on proceedings taken by the NCA or before the NCA? And uh, the second point is, when should that period start? I'm going to leave that for a moment, if you don't mind, because I have a slide or two dealing with the limitation periods set out in the directive, and I'm going to make some comment on um, what difficulties they can give rise to if played out in, in, a, in, a, in a big way. I was at a conference, I think, in London, where um, um, Peter Roth, who's the chairman of the Competition Appeals Tribunal, um, spoke on the directive and um, voiced his concern um, that if, in fact, the limitation periods and the suspension provided for those limitation periods in certain circumstances, if they were played out fully, you could, in fact, have an action running for 10 or 12 years ever before getting to a court of first instance and ever before a decision and ever before the appeal process had run its course. That intuitively doesn't sound right. That intuitively um, is a bit of a problem, I would have thought. Um, I, I'll just come back to that for a moment. Definitions, I, I, I've just put it in for information purposes. There's not much to be said about it. Obviously, it's quite important that you understand what a leniency statement is or what a settlement submission are, but it's there for you to have a look at in your own time. Equally so, that's just telling you again in, in, um, in some form as to... Um, what the overall directive And um, as you can imagine, the directive says a lot about evidence. Um, evidence is absolutely critical. Um, as indicated, Diana's going to talk to you about evidence, and I'm not really going to say anything about it, even though there's something on these slides. But uh, it really is only touching the iceberg. You could spend an entire conference confidently uh, discussing even one aspect of Article 5, the disclosure of evidence, one aspect of Article 6, dealing with evidence contained in the file of the Competition Authority, you could spend a lot, a lot of time in relation to it. Running right throughout the evidence is this concept of proportionality. Um, this concept of proportionality must be understood by us all, uh, and hopefully at this stage it has the same meaning in, in all member states. There are certain matters specified in Article 5.3 which you must take into account when considering this question of proportionality. And, in fact, there are further matters which you must add to that if you're dealing with, um, if you're dealing with a file of an NCA. Um, I suppose, in essence, proportionality, um, even though we all know what it means, if you were just you know, asked to write a description of it in three or four lines, I wonder would the result be very similar for all of us. And I doubt if it would be. Again, you, know, you can almost see what an elephant is, but you just describe it as more difficult. Um, it is 
Is it much different from making an order which is appropriate? Is it much different from making an order which is reasonable? Yes, there is a difference between proportionality and reasonableness. Reasonableness imports a lot of subjective thinking, a lot of subjective analysis, a lot of subjective intuition, really, by each of us. What I consider reasonable, either judged by the objective man or not, must have a degree of latitude within it than what you or any of you might think the same thing. Proportionality ha has more an objective um, approach. Proportionality can be tested um, in a manner in which reasonableness can't. So they're not the same thing, and I suppose it's trying to keep a balance between what is required to mount an action, what is required to kind of bring home an action, what is not oppressive, um, to the defendant company, what will um, keep a leniency program going, where will the balance between the administration of justice and access to documents fit in with the balance of confidentiality, fit in with the balance of commerce, or fit in with the balance of business? Um, and where will it fit in with national competition authorities or the Commission doing their job on the public enforcement side? But in itself, again, it is quite tricky. Um, this is quite an important article, um, and it can be used to great effect uh, by those who wish to sue for infringements of 101, 102, or their domestic equivalent. The effect of national decisions. Um, ever before the directive was published, there was a principle that if the Commission had made a final determination on the question of liability, then in a follow-on action, um, the, the infringer was bound by the operative part of the Commission's decision. I remember spending days in a case where uh, there was an issue uh, between the parties as to what the operative part of a Commission finding was. In fact, the case was Irish Sugar, which was one of the most uh, appalling cartel activities ever uh, to be conducted in Ireland. It, 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 it thus became quite difficult, even in follow-on actions, um, for intending plaintiffs to rely on the Commission decision on the question of liability um, because of those difficulties. Add to them, of course, that procedurally again, the obligation remained on a plaintiff to establish causation, damages, or all of those things. So Article 9 is to be absolutely welcomed in that you will see um, once an infringement of, has been found by final order, then that is irrefutable evidence of its establishment in the member state where it was so found. And even in other member states, it can be used to high advantage because um, before their courts, it is given um, the status of having prima facie evidence. Limitation periods. Um, I suppose the purpose of limitation periods is to make sure that um, an intended plaintiff is given a reasonable opportunity to bring the action. Um, has Article 10 achieved that reasonable balance? I wonder. Um, you will see that the minimum period is five years. You will also see that the per period does not start before the infringement has ceased. And I suppose an equivalent in our domestic law might relate to trespass on the civil side. Trespass, if, if you're in somebody's property when you shouldn't be there, is a continuing tort. So if you wish until that completely ceases, then the limitation period doesn't start. That's not fully a good analogy, because in truth, every trespass itself um, is a cause of action. Um, so it's an accumulative trespass, so to speak. But here, until the infringement has ceased, it doesn't start. Uh, not only that, but um, the claimant must know, or reasonably must know, not only of the infringement, but that um, the behaviour in question equals that, must know that the infringement has caused him harm, and must or ought to know the identity of the infringer. Now, if you look at those individually, what happens? Before a, a plaintiff can be said, to have satisfied all of those criteria um, and thus time begin to run, does he have to go to a lawyer? Is that reasonable for him to take time out? 
um, an economist, um, an accountant, or other expert. Um, when should he go to those? What effort should he make to establish uh, the underlying behavior? How does he know whether it constitutes an infringement or not? He surely can't be expected to make that decision himself. Um, and you can instantly see that you can be running into months, years, 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 ever before it starts. Um, and then there is a provision whereby if the competition authority takes proceedings, the period is suspended. And it shall end only one year, at the earliest, one year after the infringement decision has become final. Final, unappealable. And it's also suspended, suspended if you want to go into alternative dispute resolutions. Um, it is not difficult to see that you could easily be in 10 or 12 years before the action ever gets to trial, as I said. You have a five-year minimum period. It doesn't start no matter what until such time as you have identified the behavior in question, until you know, know or are reasonably to know that that constitutes an infringement, and you know the identity of the infringer. So all of that gives scope for the extension of the period in question. Then, if during it the National Competition Authority should get involved, stop. If during it there should be a reference to the alternative dispute resolution, stop. At least in that context, presumably, the infringer becomes part of it. And then you mount the action, you go to a court of first trial, you get a decision, and there's an appeal process, easily a decade or more. What's the position then under Article 6 of the Convention? Article 6 of the Convention is exactly the same as Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, access to a trial with reasonable expedition. Um, how does this um, comply with that? Query, query, query. Um, I suspect that uh, if an issue came to it, Article 6 uh, would be interpreted in such a manner as to create serious difficulties for this. Now, it will work itself out in due course, but there are very, very generous limitation periods, and um, one must realise that um, a forefront principle of all of this is to um, make sure that justice is administered. I want to just say something about joint and several liability. There's a principle, and it's a correct principle in law, that if you're a joint tortfeasor, you should be jointly and you should be severally liable for the wrong cause. No question about that. Um, there is a derogation for um, SMEs um, in certain circumstances. That derogation is stood down if, in fact, the SME in question is a ringleader. There are also uh, different provisions for an immunity recipient and contributions. Can I, can I just say one thing about um, contributions, contributors, indemnity between joint um, and several tort visas? You might have a situation where a plaintiff sues three defendants for the same wrong. He might want to settle with defendant two, but cannot settle with defendant one or defendant three. All three defendants have served notices on each other claiming contribution or indemnity. In other words, what defendant one says that, look, if the plaintiff wins against me, I want to win against defendant two, and I want to win against defendant three. In those circumstances, how does defendant two who wants to settle, how does he in fact protect his position? Because if he settles, remember, he still has these notices from defendant one, and defendant three outstanding. Um, it created quite a bit of debate in a couple of conferences previously we attended. Um, it's been part of English law since 1954. I know that because we cogged their statute in 1961 word for word. And what defendant two does, in fact, he goes to court and says, ask the judge to rule on whether or not the intended settlement between the plaintiff and defendant two is reasonable. If it's reasonable in the context of the claim, it can in fact give him certain protection against defendant one and against defendant three if they should come after him later. Complicated enough provisions, difficult enough in practice, um, unless it's sorted out in some meaningful way, it will make the settlement between the plaintiff and defendant two very difficult in fact. 
because defendants will be most reluctant um, to do that if they continue to have exposure to their co and joint tortfeas. But in principle, undoubtedly, if you commit a wrong resulting in harm, and if there are several of you involved, each of you should be fully liable in relation. Many of these provisions will be fleshed out over time. Each one of our member states will have to bring in um, a domestic measure uh, to transpose it. It will be interesting to see whether there will be much difference, differences between what each of us uh, does in that regard. Um, and when that happens, maybe we should all come back and have a look at, at all of this again. Um, there's a long journey um, ahead for this uh, directive, but it's truly to be welcomed. It's a step in the right direction. It will, in fact, penetrate into domestic situations and will eventually make it easier for individuals before each of our member states to, in fact, mount actions on the private side, which, after all, uh, is the entire objective of combining private enforcement with public enforcement. Um, the rest of the stuff you can look at in your own time.